pressing record on my end. What that means is that it's not going to capture all of your gorgeous faces, um, but at least we'll have the recording for the presentation itself and we can go from there. All right. So um, as we're going through, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and Lisa is going to be very good and let me know that those things are happening so I can capture those things in real time. I am Nobildona Fiore Leoneta Bardi and I am your brand new deputy ANS uh, minister for rubrics and competition. And so I, I'm a person who's very, very interested in process and very interested in how we do things and how we can do things better. So this is to that end, a little assist on, first of all, how we enter competition, how we put our things forward for competition, how we display those things that we've worked so hard on and how we can create better stories about our process as we do those things. Because this year, our Crown's uh, Arts and Science Championship uh, competition happens to be a virtual competition, we're going to talk specifically about how you present in this venue within this box and how we can make that more enjoyable, especially if some of you aren't really technically savvy. Uh, it might be a little bit more painful for you to ponder how do you do this in a virtual environment. But for even for those of you who are well versed in Zoom and all things uh, display electronically, uh, hopefully there will be something uh, to offer you in this presentation. So the first place I want to start is uh, just with the facts that no presentation class can be everything to everyone. Uh, so I want you to consider this presentation, really there are broad strokes. We're gonna get specific about a few things, but I really wanna get more into teaching you how to fish than just handing you a fish. Uh, so there, there. I'm going to give you some bites of fish along the way, or you know, whatever it is you want to eat, so that you're not actually starving in the process. But uh, I really want you to be able to feel that you are in control of how your artistry gets displayed. Okay, so we're going to launch ahead. Uh, I have a really strong opinion about what happens when we display our art. What we're doing is essentially taking another person or persons on a journey into our experience of something that we were excited about. So I guess the, the end to that is starting with what started you, your excitement about that thing. So what is it that led to this particular project? Like, why are you here suddenly displaying your things on a table, so to speak, um, or perhaps exactly on a table? Why, what is it that got you to this point where you created this thing? And once you've created this thing, how do you take someone into not just, oh, look, I made this thing, here it is, but I'm really excited about this thing. Let me tell you why I made this thing. Let me show you why this thing is so cool. So that's where we're going to start. We're going to start at why it is, how it is that we create that view into our experience for others. So I, I'm very much of the opinion that that excitement, that thing that you're so interested in, is really what makes everything about your ANS offering magical. You know, there are very few things that we're going to discover in the SEA. Perhaps we will, but very few things we're going to discover in the SEA that are original, mind-blowing in the world at large. Almost everything has been done already, but it's not been done by you. It's not been done from your point of view. It hasn't been done with your excitement. It hasn't been done with your cool way of looking at things or talking about things. And all of those cool things that bring you to this particular project are really what is going to make your ANS offering this singular moment in time or, you know, recorded moment in time as the case may be. Anyway, so as we're moving on. So, and I'm a little, I, I, I'm just going to say I'm talking a little quickly because I'm a little bit nervous since this is the first time I'm offering this class. So if I'm flying, will somebody just flag me and say, 
All right, so there we go. So we start with what did it, why did I get here? How did I get here? What is that thing that excites me? And then we have to think also about what's my end goal? Am I displaying this for fun? Am I entering the competition, like perhaps the Crowns AMS Championship competition that's coming very soon? Um, am I entering this for consultation? Am I entering another type of competition uh, within the kingdom or within my barony or within my local group? Knowing what the goal is will also create some context. For example, if you're competing on the kingdom level, we weigh things against a rubric. So you should maybe have looked at said rubric, uh, gone through this rubric, taken the rubric class that is so wonderfully in, in offered uh, as an invitation for everybody to take so that you have some understanding of what might be expected as an end goal. So we have a beginning, your excitement, what makes your project super uh, wonderful, and then what is the goal? And that's where you're going to start with what your project should look like. So the thing I wanted to do first is just kind of take you on an exercise um, and we're, we're going to go into a little time machine. And this particular time machine takes us to uh, the land of ANS this past February, where I submitted this uh, Veste that was supposed to go to, let's see, to, uh, I'm plugged in so it won't move where I want it to. There you go. This Veste that was supposed to go to a music festival in 1570s. So this project, when you're uh, showing a garment that's, you know, not yet embroidered and super shiny, that could be your project, but that wasn't my project. My project was all of this stuff. Like, how do we, I'm tipping stuff over, how do we create these beautiful things? How does one build a dress? What is the art of tailoring in this particular time period? So if I had just thrown all of these things on the table, kind of like they're strewn here, it might not have shown so well. So let's see what I actually did. Um, and I'm moving around because I just spilled a glass of water. So I'm going to dab that up. Did I mention I'm nervous? Ooh. All right. So if I had just gone in and displayed these things that you see here, it might have been okay and my, my judges would have come around and I would have explained to them what I did and why it was cool and it would have looked like this. And maybe I would have had my documentation somewhere in the middle of the table and it would have looked okay. But what if instead I start to tell a story of a 16th century woman who would have had to gone to a tailor shop to get bara tapes made for herself? And what if I realized fairly early that all of these things are very light in color? and that they were going to be hard to see on a table so that in order to better show them, I could change the surface that I was working on. So what if then, when I display these Bada tapes, I put them across a black surface? What if then I presented things that are related to the task, but maybe are just tools that I used, not necessarily things that I made. But what if that began the story that then I was going to tell? What if then I invited people to practice pad stitching on the crazy pad stitching that's inside my garment? What if that became part of my display? What if I surrounded it with other work that I had done to show the context of what an artisan might do in fiber arts as a woman in this period? What if I put things that had nothing to do with this project in the space, but that would create 
a little bit more of the palette. And then what if suddenly that was the display instead of the first display? That could be a simple way of doing it, like insert contrasting color tablecloth or even fabric. This is just a piece of black fabric that I used at a convention once. Um, <laughs> it can be anything. But what if this wasn't enough? What if I have a lot of stuff and I now have three feet on a table and my space is very, very limited? What if I also have with me a bunch of source materials that the judges are definitely going to want to see? So what if then I change levels on the table so that I'm creating different heights. Now I don't necessarily want to show my cardboard. But what if I build upward and borrow space from other places? I've now completely compacted my display into two, into two feet. And this is not like all organized and wonderful because I just kind of cobbled it together just now. But again, it tells a story. It tells a story of the person who studied the patterns as well as the potential persona who might have created that thing. That's generally how I would create the story of how this dress got made. But I perhaps wouldn't even stop there. Perhaps this dress, which is on a dress form that's burgundy, um, which is very similar to the color of the dress. The dress is a beautiful ganjanta silk, so it's changeable. It has an iridescence to it. An iridescence that you're seeing because it's lit in a certain way. But it's also losing something because of how it's displayed. So one of the things that we know from design is that we tend to understand things better in contrast than we do by themselves. So what does that mean? When you're looking at something like a silk gown on a dress form, especially a dress form that's very similar to it in color, you might not be able to understand the difference between it and the base where it is. But if, for example, I decided instead to cover this dress form, again, not neatly because I'm just hacking this together at the moment, but if I decided to neatly during competition, cover this dress form so that the interior is black velvet, suddenly the shininess of the silk is better understood because of the contrast. So that's just kind of like a very quick and dirty and not particularly elegant kind of hack through the very short change to my display that I made inside of this room. So what is the moral of the story there? The first thing you need is to have a point of view, to have a story that you're trying to share. That story comes from those things that excited you initially, those things that are important to you, those things that you think are cool, the discoveries you make along the way in your project. You do need some lighting. That can be the lamps in your house, outdoor light. Um, I am using a lot of light in this room. So um, my favorite trick that I was going to do today is to show a little bit of what can happen when you don't have good lighting. So the beauty of this silk that you can probably see how iridescent and lovely it is if I move it. It has a very distinctive color as it's shifting. That color comes from this light. And if I turn it off, it's sort of shiny. It's getting some lighting for over here. If I turn off the other additional light, I 
actually that looks pretty cool but <laughs> but it doesn't show all of the iridescence it shows just this so I happen to like it totally not lit so I like defeated my own purpose but if I was going to want to show what's special about the fabric ta-da now I show all of the shiny of the fabric not just that gleam from above so I happen to have a lot of lighting in this house because of what I do for work, but you don't need fancy lights. You can gather uh, task lighting, your embroidery light. If you have one of those little embroidery things with a uh, uh, magnification on it, those work really, really well for showing uh, very specific types of work. You can film through that magnifying ring, um, any lamps you have in the house, or just moving things so that you're displaying them above the, uh, below the light you have. So that sort of thing can help quite a bit. And maybe even trying to, if your schedule permits, really do your recording, your display, your capture of your item in the daytime when you can get the best light. So it's just something that you might have to plan ahead for depending on what your schedule is like. But if you're thinking that you must record in the evening, you have to pick your battles and figure out how you're gonna flood your area so that you can light your item as, as well as possible. All right, so point of view, lighting, and then you need a capture plan. <laughs> so how are you gonna actually give the story a substance? So are you going to use your, um, your mobile phone as your camera, or are you gonna use a, uh, an actual camera? Are you going to use, uh, it, it, are you able to capture digital images or do you have to capture them on film, people still do that, right? <laughs> um, do you want to catch video of what you're doing? Um, is video not something that's really something you know how to do or something that you want to attempt? Do you want to do a lot of talk to camera and do a kind of display table, uh, which is a fine idea. You could set it up as if we were in the hall and put everything where you would put it in the hall and make sure that it's captured in that way and talk as if the judges just walk up to you. That That's completely an option. So once you have this minimum of having a point of view, the story you're telling, having some sort of lighting situation, even that, if that's outside light and whatever you have, and having a capture plan, deciding whether you're going to take photos, take video, and how you're going to use audio as narrative. Things that might improve your work, improve uh, how that presentation gets elevated are things like advanced lighting, like making, you know, good use of light bulbs without their, um, the, uh, a light bulb without its lampshade is a very bright, very focused light. Uh, bringing task lighting into the room, bringing something like I mentioned earlier, the embroidery hoop into the room. If you have specific lights, using the flashlight on your iPhone, a person holding a flashlight is a lighting is a lighting person so <laughs> whatever you have uh bringing it into the space and then we don't really um think about it much as a lighting option for video but for what we do lighting some candles that ambient can create not just really good lighting for things like food or things like uh, work that might have some shine on it. Um, if I was displaying gold or, or silver work, I would most certainly want candlelight because nothing quite works off of uh, gold and silver as well as candlelight does. So thinking about what types of lighting you can put into your space, but thinking of it as a design rather than just, I need as much light as possible. Uh, thinking of what it is, how do I want to light it? What What is the specific thing about this piece that makes it wonderful? And how do I light for that? So a good example of this is if you are going to have a beverage. So I happen to have poured a little bit of wine in a glass. So if I was going to uh, brew a, be a beverage and I want to show um, what the color of that beverage is, sure, I can just put it up to the camera and I could flick it around um, or I can put it really near a light. And uh, let's see if I can switch cameras again. I can put it really near a light and kind of compare 
what it does here. I can swish it around and try to get more of that light. But I can also do things like changing cameras again. I can also do things like pouring it in bright light to kind of show how it refracts in that way. And if I actually knew where my flicker was, I would light the candle because, actually I know exactly where it is, because when we're dealing with beverages, in particular things that have some sort of pigment in them, candlelight is going to give you some of your best lighting for food. Now this is not fair. I will try the other one. <laughs> there you go. So if I was going to pour back into this glass, I happen to like this glass because it's tinted a little green for this purpose because it allows you to see a lot of the jewel tone of the color. And candlelight makes that more possible. I can even try it in the other glass. Oh, there we are. Can you guys see that? That's making that little Julie tone. So you could catch just a little bit of video of your beverage being lit in different ways. And suddenly it becomes not just here's the recipe and here's what I did, but here's the magic of how that looks in a glass. And here is, here is what it looks like in its truest form in something clear. So even if you're going to eventually pour it into a more period looking vessel, displaying it in clear glass or even in slightly green tinted glass is gonna give you a lot more characteristic of that coloring of that food, of that texture, of the way it moves. And then the pour can be another added way that you show artistry and what the, the actual tactile, tangible thing of that beverage is. Same thing with food. When you're displaying food, even if you're going to serve it into a, a more period looking vessel, displaying it to start with on a white plate gives us a lot of sense of what are the colors here? What are the things that make this interesting? So that's just one of those ways to play with how we put things uh, into the sphere to start with. And my beautiful notes went away, so I don't know what goes next. There they are. I'm just gonna laugh and say that they are completely wet from where I spilled the water earlier. So the comedy, the comedy. All right. so. We talked about advanced lighting. We talked a little bit about changes in levels. So that's just how things are in a room. The way that I'm sitting here is a little bit chaotic, but not an accident. So I'm at a lower level than my dress. My camera is set up on this particular device so that I can stand. And then the other device is placed towards the props that I have on the table. Um, you might not have two cameras, but you can still think of levels. And one of my very favorite ways of putting your camera phone to use is Ziploc and duct tape. So you can take a little Ziploc bag, make sure that there is no plastic in front of your camera, tape around it so that you can secure to the tape, and you can tape that anywhere. You need a tripod, tape it to the wall. You need to, you know, there's a weird angle, tape it to whatever, you know, use it, use it in any way that you can, but the Ziploc bag will protect your phone from, you know, the errant tape marks, but you can end up putting your phone on any surface to uh, go ahead and record or, to, or photograph whatever it is that you need to record a photograph in that moment. So in that way, just how you're looking at it, the angles of how you're looking at it can be altered very simply with one device. So even though I'm switching around cameras, I don't want you to feel that that's like a requirement. I just have lots of toys in the house, but that is not neither expected, nor will it really serve you that well 
it, it, as part of your project. It's just, you know, extra. The other things are experiential things. So for example, uh, at my table at um, Crown Zayness, I had pad stitching to show people how horribly painful it is to pad stitch these particular layers of things. I can't have you stitch on this, but I can stitch on this. I can uh, bring a volunteer from my home to stitch on this and actually show you what the effort level is to stitch on this. As a matter of fact, any part of your project that you're working on can now become a kind of capital and a view into your process. So if you're brewing, taking a, a short video at one of the steps of your brewing process, or if you're cooking something, taking video of different parts of the cooking process where you talk about what you're doing or why you're doing it a certain way. Um, if you're sewing, you can take, you know, just a little video of a little stitch work. It doesn't have to be, and I will say it should not be, hours and hours and hours <laughs> of you working on your thing because our judges have other lives that we want to send them off to as well. But it does, it does help to show people a snapshot into you doing the work. And it doesn't have to be every shot of you in garb, although that's nice, um, doing all the work, but it gives us kind of a viewpoint of what it is that it was for you to actually do the project. And even things like you pour, you you brewed the thing, you took some video, you you swished it around, you showed all the light. Take a sip, describe what it tastes like, describe what it feels like in your mouth. Um, maybe have someone else drink it and use their descriptive language to describe what it is they taste, feel. Uh, taking uh, audio of what sounds are in a place. For example, if something has a very particular snap or a very particular a sound as it's cooking or a very particular sound as you're doing it, that's a sound that can be captured and then brought into your person presentation as a way to bring in a, a group of people into your experience where they can't actually touch the thing. And then of course, because we're not because we're not face to face, some of the ways that these things are used aren't really in our face. So perhaps, for example, if I was doing uh, the Bada tapes uh, here as a presentation for ANS over virtual format, rather than having the tapes, I'd maybe make one or maybe just kind of uh, measure myself or maybe talk about what that process is or maybe actually talk through the Elsega text or any number of things. There are different ways to conceptualize it and all of those different ways are going to be most wonderful if there's something that come out of the way you actually think and you actually view your project. But that's a little bit of an experiential aspect of how your project came together that I think in this particular venue, that's where the strength of virtual is, that view into what happened before you got to the hall, what happened before the project ended up on a table to be explained to someone. So I think it's a unique, a, a unique opportunity we have right now with this particular, uh, I guess, virtual environment to show a little bit of the behind the scenes. And to, and to not make it fussy, I think also it's, it, it's possible to get a little bit fussy about it because you're being videotaped and it, it feels like somebody's now in your personal space and you're, they're seeing your process in a way that they haven't in past competitions or in past displays or anything like that. But really thinking about it as inviting people into your home and thinking about it as someone that you would actually want to share your home with. So sometimes when we're recording, we tend to put our fear out there. I'm recording and this makes me nervous. So I would say the camera should always be in your mind, the person you love the most, the person you want to share the story with the most, the person that you just delight in explaining things to. And keep that person as your audience in mind, because hopefully those people don't scare you and you can tell your story and show your process a little bit more specifically if you're making the camera an ally and speaking to it as if it were a friend.
right? Um, and I feel like I've been talking a lot. Are there any questions yet? I can just plow through, or if anybody has a question, I can jump in now. Sounds great. All right, so I talked briefly about um, what we call the law of contrasts, and this is kind of important for this medium. It's important for all of our ANS displays, but it's especially important here in the virtual environment. And that is that we understand things in contrast better than we do in similarity. So for example, putting things that are white against black makes those things easier to see. Putting things that are different textures next to each other makes the difference in the texture a little bit more obvious. But also putting things that are unlike each other but that are easily con uh, that ha are conceptually easy for us to understand can be useful. For example, when you're displaying things, if there is a way that the size of that thing could get confused, putting something that everybody knows the size of um, next to it can uh, conceptualize that for the viewer a little bit better. Um, usually in modern uh, environments, what we use is a quarter because most people know what a quarter looks like in terms of size. But for our purposes, it might be something like a thimble or something like, I, I don't know, an awl or some, something that we might all have had in our hands at some point. Um, and I'm totally losing my ideas about what that might be, but you might come up with some other ones, perhaps a, a thing of thread or a piece of uh, beeswax so that it becomes a little bit easier for people to conceptualize what the size of your item is. If what your item has is a color that might be uh, really beautiful and rich, but not obvious to people who aren't there, you might need to light that in a very specific way. So what I brought as a prop for this is this totally gorgeous blue, dark blue and black bowl. So somebody made this and created this beautiful pattern within it. And the pattern is all but invisible in this lighting. So to show this to its best light, I could just transfer to I could transfer to the other camera and that gives me a, a good view so I could move whatever my camera is so I get a better lit view. I could also put that against something white, just to give it a little bit more contrast. And if I wanted to get really cute, I could put something of a contrasting color that has nothing to do with it nearby it, just so that it becomes obvious that not just is that blue and black, but the rim is actually black. Which is something that you might notice if you're into pottery and you might have missed totally until the random like spool of thread was in the picture. So it's just ways of which uh, ways in which that you can create contrasts in the way you're viewing a work. Some things are easier to photograph than others. Some things are easier to see in different lighting than others and you might have to play with it to see what the best way to capture your particular item is. So the other thing that I think is important when we're doing this type of project, um, when we're doing virtual projects specifically, but also something that you can do when we get back to in-person activities, is solving for your weaknesses and playing to your strengths. So for example, if in your project, the there is a place that you know you've looked at the rubric you know that this particular part of your project is not the shiniest this is where things are maybe not exactly the way you wanted them to be or where you know that there's a just you didn't have the time or the interest to go deeper into this particular area 
that particular thing should not be front and center in your display. The part of it that you got super excited about, the part of it that you are really proud of, the part of it that makes your heart sing, that should somehow show itself a little bit better in your storyline. Um, all of it's going to be visible to the judges at some point, but that doesn't mean that you need to display the faults front and center. You can actually get your joy out of the process by making sure that what you bring forward is what really excites you about what you did. All right, moving on. Um, I will say that uh, some of you might have like some really wonderful uh, audiovisual wiz wizardry. Um, I, I would say use whatever you have, but don't worry about being too slick um, because that's not the point. Uh, we're trying to reenact uh, non-audiovisual times. So if you get into a place where you're getting really into your skill and moving four cameras around and doing all sorts of cool stuff, that is wonderful, but completely unnecessary for this purpose and actually might confuse issues while the judges are trying to just figure out what exactly it is that you did. So just keep that in mind. Having a very high audiovisual acumen is not going to get you extra points in the finished product if the project itself isn't at the same caliber as your AV wizardry. All right. So when we talk about, um, I, I guess the, the kind of shorthand for what I'm talking about today is show, tell, guide. So we're trying to show what our story is through what we were trying to do. Um, we're trying to place things in a certain order. So maybe it tells people uh, what our journey was through the project or it, it kind of excites them as to what their journey is through our project. We show through lighting and levels. Uh, we can show parts of our process, what the sounds were, what the smells were, um, all of those things. But then we get into the tell part. And the talking part is sometimes where people get tripped up. So my recommendations here, and I have a, a lot more here, I guess, than everywhere else, but this isn't a, a voice and speech presentation class, so I'm not going to um, go down the rabbit hole of all of the things you should be doing about your voice. Um, but suffice it to say that planning goes a long way in terms of how you conceptualize your project. And I actually recommend if you have nervousness around speaking, you don't have to do the speaking part and the audiovisual, the photo capture or the video at the same time. As a matter of fact, uh, if you look at a lot of professional bloggers or, or podcasters or vloggers on YouTube, a lot of what they've done is recorded a process. They've edited, sometimes speeding up parts of that process. You don't have to do that, but they record a process and then they narrate, or, they narrate over the recording. This is something that not only should you do, <laughs> can you do, but you should probably do if you have nervousness around speaking, because it's much easier to look at a video of your thing and describe what it is than it is to try to remember all the right words that you want to use it at that moment if you're trying to capture them together. And then it also means that if you have somehow said the wrong thing or, or messed up or, or said something that you're like, oh, really, that's not what I want to say, or your 10-year-old runs into the room or your cat attacks your foot or any number of things <laughs> that can happen in real life, um, you still can use the video and just redo the audio and not feel like it's a big deal. Or vice versa. You had this beautiful audio, you described this thing, and as you were describing your bar tapes, you were like, ooh, that is not good. I have made a mistake there. I'm going to redo that tape and I'm going to re-video with my new product, but I'm going to still narrate it as, you know, that very cool narration I just did because there's nothing wrong with it. So there, there are benefits to doing them as two separate things. And the speaking part, it doesn't have to be really, really smooth. This isn't a competition on how well you speak. This isn't a competition on how shiny and suave and debonair you are. There is no singing required, although I personally find it delightful. So, you know, knock yourself out. It's about defining, describing, and detailing what you did. 
So you're talking about, you're defining your process, what you did, you're describing it, you're giving details about it. Um, you might even be displaying that in a kind of video format or a photo format, but you're not necessarily having to do that with all of the smooth, like things that you might think are associated with a video presentation. We don't need you to be actors. We don't, nobody needs you to suddenly develop the ability to have the gift of gab. It's really about talking about just what you did, what excites you about it. And that always for me is going to be the number one strength that you have. There's nothing like contagion. If you are passionate about something, it's contagious. So the more passion you can show about why you did a thing, and that doesn't have to be like high excitement, my voice is loud and I'm talking really fast excitement. Um, if you're excited about something, it will show. Your passion and your detail will show. And then if you're super, super, super nervous about doing even that, I offer that you can have somebody interview you about your project. And that can be somebody talking to you, maybe even uh, it can be on a Zoom call that gets recorded so that you have people going back and forth. Or if you have someone in your house, just ask you about what is this? How, how does this work? How, what is the use of it? How did you make it? Why were you interested in this? That sort of thing. You can prompt them with what questions you think might be important based on whatever the goals are for your particular project. Uh, could be the rubric, for example. Uh, they can ask you questions specifically about what it is that you've made and why you've put things together in a certain way. And that is a, often a good way to get around the nervousness around presentation. Again, the point is not be a professional speaker here. The point is show us this beautiful work that you've created and tell us how you got there. All right. All right, so we talked about um, how to show things a little bit and how to how to talk about things a little bit. And um, if you have specific questions about that, we can um, definitely dive in uh, deeper in a little bit. But I wanted to talk about what I mean by guide, the show tell guide. So I always want to make sure that the voice of the artisan is in the space. And I don't mean the physical voice, although it can be. I mean, your point of view, your unique lens through which you saw your work. And when we're guiding people, we're guiding them to introduce them to what we did and introduce them to our thoughts about it and, and send them on that journey. When I, when I did uh, a &S this past February, my whole point was not to display the gown behind me. My whole point was to, and, and you know, it was there and it's, you know, it, it's good work for what it is. Um, and they inspected that a lot. But what I wanted them to look at was the process. I wanted them to look at my Barra tapes and understand why Barra's were used. I wanted the, them to understand what a tailor's workshop did. I wanted them to understand illegitimacy and uh, it, what illegitimate women might have to do in Florence to afford a dress like this. I wanted them to understand a bunch of things that had nothing to do with that dress. So that was my work, to take them on that journey with me when the primary thing that happened when people approached the table was sucked into the dress. So I had to change that narrative and guide them through what I wanted them to see. And then of course, go look at my hand stitches, go look at all the time, it's, you know, it's well put together, that's, that's good. But that's not what I was excited about. That wasn't what really thrilled me. So my, my voice, my lens was, let me show you what, what currency was in the fabric or was in the, the dress. Why do we need them? How did they get them? What did they cost? All of those things. 
But that was my particular bias and my particular voice and lens. Somebody could build a dress just like this all by hand and it could be super snazzy cool and they could not care at all <laughs> about the other things that were important to me. So their lens is going to be different. Their lens might be about look at how many stitches per inch and look at how I built this corner and look at what the back of the collar does and all of these things might be the way that they conceptualize their project. So I'd like to invite you to let your voice, your, your lens of your project, be at the front of the project. So when we enter competition, it's, it feels different than what it is. It feels like we're putting energy out to show, I made this thing, like me, like me, like me, like it. But it's very different. It should be, and it can be, I like this thing, I made this thing, come in here with me and look at this thing I did. One of them feels infinitely more pleasurable than the other. If you're pushing your project out, people might love it and people might not get it. But if you're bringing people in, your project remains yours. Your lens remains yours. And if they like it, that's great. They get to stay here with you. And if they don't, off they go. And they don't damage your experience of your project. So I would invite you to see competition as ranking yourself against yourself and trying to bring people into your, your kind of magical space with a thing, even if it's not a hundred percent of everything you want to do, even if it's not perfect, even if, and well, okay, nothing's perfect. Even if it's not like as close to perfect as you could have gotten it. Um, even if it's not really the best work you're ever going to do, hopefully it's not the best work you're ever going to do unless you're stopping right there. But you know, <laughs> whatever it is that you're offering for your display or your competition, really thinking about how to bring people into your world on that rather than pushing your world outward and hoping it gets accepted. I think that's a very precarious place for us to be as artisans. So as we're setting up tables or setting up lighting or, or talking about our project, really thinking about how to bring people inward, I think is a little bit better than thinking about how to push ourselves outward. Okay. Um, Let's see. So the last thing I wanted to, well, I guess this is not really the last thing I want to talk about, but um, a thing I want to talk about is entries that aren't traditionally sexy. So things that don't photograph where, well, things that are dark, um, things that might be a, a research paper that has a prop and you're like, okay, should I even bother with the prop? Because, you know, video and all of that weird stuff, maybe if it's really tangible. Um, for example, I, I think of Mr. Selena's uh, project where she had this beautiful research, but one of the major components was the be, being able to feel the changes. Uh, it was a project on dyeing and being able to feel the changes in the fiber was kind of a huge part of that project. So if that project was done virtually, could it just be the research? Absolutely but there's something about that tactile sense that over a virtual medium, touching them and describing what those changes are, maybe even showing them might've been enough. You know, thankfully we got to actually see those in the hall and play with them in the hall, but even in a virtual component, you can move through things that might not seem obvious in ways that are descriptive. For example, if I had to talk about this little piece of Dupioni silk. Um, I could show it to the camera. I could probably get it super close to the camera so you could actually see the slubbiness of it. I could move it and I'll move it near my microphone so you can kind of see it. I could make the sound of the fabric so that you can see it. I can move it around. Yeah. There are different ways that we can uh, kind of put that into context for people. Again, you could use something of opposition that's so light that it almost plays like uh, white against the black. But it's clearly a blue, which I can show you by putting it next to something yellow. 
So there are ways to show things off, even in this format, um, if they don't seem obvious or sexy in some way. And some projects are just, um, they're really interesting and wonderful, but even in the live space, they don't look shiny and exciting. So how do you elevate your work? You're, you might have to make it obvious what something is. So for example, if you're uh, creating something that lies pretty flat on the table, and nobody necessarily knows what it is, people might not approach your table. But if you can create some levels, tilt something up, um, perhaps even have some sort of indication of what it is. So for example, if I was suddenly, uh, well, if I was a different person, if I was, I, I'm going to use Daroga's example, if I was creating this beautiful uh, research about fencing things, um, fencers might want to come look at this, but they might not necessarily want to take time off fencing to look at this a &S table right now, unless, super cool, it's about fencing. So I might take some sort of fencing pointy thing and put it very prominently near my table so that it seems obvious, oh, maybe that's about fencing. Um, if I was doing some sort of lace work, um, I often see these beautiful, beautiful fabric pieces of lace, white lace on a white tablecloth, flat on a table. So it's really, really hard to then conceptualize what is that. Um, you can use a frame to kind of put it upwards. Um, I am the queen of taking household implements and making them into something different. So this is my music stand. My music stand is a stand for all things. So perhaps it's a music stand. Perhaps it holds lace. Perhaps it, you know, carries books. Perhaps it is any number of things. Um, some of the things I used in the past, I will put anything on a black hanger. I have black velvet hangers in my closet. You can even hide the hanger bit and display it in that way. Um, duct tape is a good friend. Actually, I use gaffer's tape, which is more expensive, but if you're going to be displaying when we're back in person, you might want some gaffer's tape because it comes off of anything without damaging it, but it, it pins very securely. So you can kind of, Jerry rig all sorts of things uh, like my, you know, tape your cell, cell phone to a wall kind of situation. I tend to use gaffer's tape for that, but you can also tape together all sorts of shapes of things so that you can have a frame for your lace or you can pile up a bunch of books and throw something over it. So suddenly there's a platform. You can get creative with how to create different dynamics of showing off what it is that you have. Now in this environment, when we're doing it virtually, you wear, it's almost a cheat because one of the, the things that you can do is you don't have to always have the levels and the display that we need in person. If it's lace for a partlet, put on the partlet. If it's a piece of lace that's a handkerchief, show the handkerchief, uh, show it on someone, set a beautiful table and show it on the table, however it is that you want to display that. If it's, you know, if it's something that has a use, it doesn't look very sexy on a table, but it has a purpose, show us what it looks like when you're using it. You know, what, it, what does it look like to slice with that knife you made? What does it look like to shoot from that bow that you designed? You know, all of these things can suddenly open up variables that we didn't have sitting in the ANS conference uh, space on these, eight, you know, eight foot conference tables. So in a way, we have access to a little bit more creativity about how we can tell our stories and, and put those things forward. But especially if you have an item that you know doesn't have a lot of curb appeal, get creative about how it is that you're going to show that. All right, looks like there's a lot of conversation in the chat. Everybody okay? <laughs> you're, you're muted, Lissa. You're talking, but you're on mute. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. It's really just uh, details about the competition. Okay. People are asking. Um, I just want you to continue with what you're doing because I think this is really good. And just so everyone knows, if you didn't hear the chat, on Sunday there will be a consult with the consoles. 
Hopefully people say that wrong. Um, but anyway, uh, there'll be an opportunity for people to submit questions. I think it's there in the chat so we can answer in more detail some of those questions about the AI composition and how it will work. Absolutely. All right. So moving on. Um, I guess what I was trying to get at was you get to define the wonder of your item. So whatever it is, however it, it, it plays in real space, however it is that it looks on a table, you get to determine how amazing your item is. So um, I, I, I like the example of, um, and we've all had this moment, I bought this cup at Penzik and I showed it to everybody. Like, I'm so excited about this cup. And they're like, it's a glass, Gina. It's not even a very big glass. But I was going crazy about the glass. And then I realized, oh, wait, they don't get it. I'm like, hold the glass. Because it's super, super light because it was blown in this very traditional, um, um, uh, you know, medieval renaissance 14th century way. And so the glass is like nothing. It's super, super thin, weighs nothing at all. So they couldn't get that without touching the glass. Well, if I had just made this glass and my beautiful glass works that I don't have, but maybe, you know, someday, um, and I wanted to show you how cool this glass is, the most magical thing I could do for you is hand it to someone else. I could describe to you how I made it. I can show you all the striations, but I could prepare someone and say, can you hold this glass and tell me what do you notice about it? And the first thing they're going to notice is how light it is. And they're going to tell you how light it is. So now this other person has become a prop in my description. So that's to say that one of the most useful things you might have in your very own house is a way to conceptualize your project for people who can't conceptualize it with you. So if there are people in your house, um, borrowing them for specific moments might be useful, especially if what you're entering is food and it's not, uh, if for some reason it doesn't get into a judge's belly, um, being able to have someone else taste it and describe what that experience is like is a way that you can conceptualize that, that particular thing. So I, I'm trying to be very broad because all of our ANS can be amazingly broad and, and diverse. I'm just trying to invite you to think about different ways in which you can show all the super spiffy, spiffy things about what it is that you did. All right. Um, the other thing is uh, sometimes you don't know what it is that you know what you think is cool, but you might not know what somebody who is a master of that art would look at to see what you did. So for example, before I started sewing, um, and actually my first ANS thing, I, I hadn't sewn very long. So, you know, I arrive here with underwear and I put it on a table. I didn't have a dress form. I put it on a table. I did what I told you not to do. I put a white thing on a white tablecloth <laughs> and just laid it there. And um, the thing that I did not expect to happen was uh, costuming Laurel walks up to my table and turns my thing inside out. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, sat there kind of freaking out a little bit. And then I realized, you know, this is fine. It's, it's all fine. Um, but, <laughs> but I didn't know to ask that question. So it could be that you know all of the questions that a master of your art would ask, but you might not. So if you're submitting something that you're newish at or something that you have some blind spots or, or gray areas about, what might someone who's been doing this for 10 years longer than I am look at? Um, maybe ask someone who is more experienced what they would look at in this particular project. And if you don't know, let people be matchmakers for you. Um, I volunteer. You can, you can um, ping me and say, hey, I have a project in underwater basket weaving, and I would really like uh, an expert in underwater basket weaving to um, tell me what they would look at in their project. We can matchmake to get you that person if you don't know already 
who those people are so that you can ask some questions about uh, conceptually, what do you want to see in this type of project? What, what would you like me to make sure I don't miss in my display of this project? And you can do that whether you're competing or displaying. Um, that's naturally part of consultation, especially if you end up um, consulting and there happens to be someone who's expert in what it is that you do. But it's also something that you can just seek for yourself as you're creating art in the world, just to know what it is that someone with vastly more experience and something sees in your project. Does that mean that that's the path you have to walk? Absolutely not. It just means that you should know what the parameters are. You know, I, I always say that it's very, very helpful before you make a square bowl to realize that most of them are circular. So that is one thing. Um, let's see, see, see. table again it's not a table anymore it's more of a service i've put the link in the chat um to the place on our web page that talks about the service and you can fill out the form and that's probably the best way where we can match you with someone who can uh, work with you it's not just for competition but it can be really useful for that competition awesome thank you for remembering that well of course because you know you're awesome <laughs> remember the things um, okay, and the other thing, um, I, I, as we're coming back around, and um, hopefully we'll have some questions because I've packed in a bunch of time for questions, but if you're not really uh, adept at technology, if you're not a person who wants to run multiple cameras or any of those things, don't. If you're not someone who wants to like uh, figure out what all the lighting things are, just don't. The point is to show your artistry in a way that is true to you, that shows us your passion, that shows us as much of what you did as, as is possible without somebody physically handling what you did. But it's not about how spiffy does it look. I just, I cannot say this en enough. Like it's not professional presentation hour. It is not like, are you gonna get awards in videography of the year or beautiful camera? work or I guess it's called photography photography <laughs> um, it, it's it's not about those things it's about the thing you made and how you made it and how you documented that that project and and what you love about it and what's you know I, I'm gonna keep coming back to passion because what it turns out is that pleasure is the best thing ever if you can take pleasure in what you're doing, if you can give people pleasure in the experience of what you did, then the scores on the rubric, which are super shiny and wonderful for many, many things, can't jog your personal value of what you did. So sometimes I think if we forget why it is that something gave us pleasure, uh, a, a rubric score can kick us off of that. But if you stay solidly within that pleasure that you gave yourself, that pleasure that you're giving to other people as they see your project. Um, I think that's a good place for you to have kind of a sane relationship with presenting your art to others. So I think that's where I want to end. If, if I can uh, inspire you to do anything as you're presenting all of these things, and I can take questions about Zoom and video and lighting and all of that stuff. But when it really comes down to it, I hope I inspire you to be super curious about how it is that your unique thing can play in light, can play in space, can play with sound, um, can be photographed or placed or, or arranged in ways that contrast it to something different, that enhance it in some tangible way, that show everybody who's coming to see it or the judges in a virtual format, what it is that made you excited about it, what, why you did it, and importantly, what's special about this moment in time with this particular artistry. So that is what I have today. Um, if I can add one more thing, um, do rehearse anything that you want to record. Just rehearse it, rehearse it, rehearse it. Um, 
Keep in mind that the average person speaks about 130 to 140 mile, uh, words per minute. So if you write 10,000 words, you're going to be talking for a while <laughs> and probably longer than you really want to on video. And if you write 300 words, three minutes later, you're going to be like, huh, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> so just keep that in mind that at some point, you want to run through everything you want to say and practice that um, with people, maybe. You know, I volunteer if you really want to throw it at someone. Like, I, I love kind of listening to people's stuff and I nerd out on everybody's artistic endeavors. So hit me up if you need a victim. I mean, volunteer. Um, I have a question for yeah. the chat that I think is uh, best for you to answer. Would background music be considered distracting? For some projects, I don't think so. And it depends on the background music. If you have um, a beautiful recording of a madrigal music from the 15th century, the, what I blasted at Lissa earlier today um, at an appropriate volume, running in the background of your 15th century project, then yeah, that's just mood. So you can have music for sure, um, keeping in mind that your music has to be several la layers lower than what your speaking voice is going to be. Now, if you're going to take my advice and record and then do uh, a sound overlay of describing um, your recording, then you can play music the whole time you're going object by object. And then you can control the volume of your audio track without without the sound on it over top. So you don't have to futz with, did I get it right? Can they hear me more clearly than the background music? Um, also, just kind of an aside, if you're playing background music that has words to it, you want to make sure that the words are not in a foreign language that's going to trip up the person who's listening. So in this kingdom you're going to avoid English and French. So you can have vocal music playing in the background, just avoid vocal music that's in English and French, because otherwise their ear is going to continue to find context in the words of the music. And here you were describing this beautiful thing you did, and they were off with the merry maids and milking. So <laughs> just um, keep that in mind that there's just that, that neurological trap that if you play background music that has a verbal component, you want to make sure you go away from languages that are going to um, trip up most people. Now, this could be a fluke. So if I'm one of your judges, you have to avoid a lot of languages. Um, if Magrat is one of your, your, your judges, you might have said, oh, Greek's, uh, Greek's no problem. Uh, and yeah, yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> so uh, you don't always know what languages people speak. So sometimes it's better to keep to an inter in instrumental context um, just to avoid that kind of neurological ver <laughs> verbal stack. Mongolian should be no problem. It's true. You are so wise. Go with the Mongolian music. <laughs> question from earlier on um, that um, Amalia and I kind of tried to answer, but I want to throw to you also. Um, the idea of using PowerPoint and one person specifically mentioned, um, whereas on a display you might have a folder with various head pictures. Um, for the online display, you could have a PowerPoint with various uh, pictures. Correct. Um, PowerPoint's one of those things, if you are very good at PowerPoint, if you're good at those slide presentations, they can be very, very effective. Um, so if you're doing a PowerPoint, I want you to think about it as things that happen in quadrants. So the same path that you might take a judge through at your table, you're gonna wanna put that into the PowerPoint so that it's paced in that way. Um, things to keep in mind, absolutely no one on a screen wants to read anything that's lower than 24 size font. And ideally, you're actually aiming for like 40 because most of us think our vision is better than it is. <laughs> it is what it is, right? So um, if you're doing PowerPoint, really thinking about how it is that font is going to be displayed, really thinking about making it image heavy rather than putting a bunch of words on a slide. So 
it's one of those things that um, when I teach professional presentation, I always trip people up because uh, slide decks used to be like, have 10 or 20 slides and put up all of your words and it's all of these things. And now what I teach people is have 70 slides, but have most of them be a single, uh, have five slides that are like your five concepts and that's one sentence on a slide and have all of the rest of it be images that's going to actually make somebody's brain connect with what you did so that you're not presenting as if you were presenting in your college for a class. You're presenting something experiential, something that's going to connect with people, something that's going to make their brain exciting, a brain excited. Because the fact is that some of us have some very negative connotations around PowerPoint. So you have to break that a little bit if you're going to use PowerPoint. You have to make people not feel like they fell into work. They're still having fun. It's still the SEA. You know, shadows and light, shadows and light. Uh, all of those things. Does that make sense? Any other questions about presentation matters? Thoughts about specific things that you might be thinking of putting in? Yeah, please. Um, is, is my uh, voice on? I hear you. Okay, good. So um, my presentation is words. It's okay. wordsmithing. Okay. So, um, it's kind of like, well, the main part of it is, hey, look at my words. And um, I color code them for the kind of syllables and, and alliteration and whatnot. But yeah, it, it is words. Okay. So it, when it is words, and so is it mostly written word or is it meant to be spoken word? Um, it's words for scroll. Okay. Um, I have a recording of Malcolm saying them in in court, so I was going to ask him if I had his you know permission to use that. Um, and so I have like the actual recording of them being spoken in court. Um, and I do have a copy of the illumination, which I did not do. I didn't do the calligraphy or the illumination. I just wrote the words. Okay. So I like to include that, but I don't like to use it all the time because that's not the focus of my thing. Okay. So when you're talking about wordsmithing, is your, and I'm going to ask you questions that you might not know the answer to or, or not want to share yet, and that's fine too. Is your project then to show how you smith the words or is your project to show one specific instance of smithing of the words? I'm totally misusing this. I'm, I'm abusing this verb. <laughs> um, it's, um, it's the words for a court Bernie that went out um, not too long ago. Okay. Actually, it went out in one of the first ethereal, like first or second ethereal courts of uh, Margarita. Excellent. So when you're talking about your work, when, when you decide what you're going to show, if you're going to try to show it as PowerPoint, you're just going to need more slides okay. where you show like, and maybe using effects. If you're going to, was it you who wanted to use PowerPoint or, or not? I, I mean, it could, or more to the point, I could get my husband to do it for me. Yeah. So um, it might be interesting to have things, if you're going to use a, a kind of computerized thing, uh, the temptation to me would be to maybe have words float in as they come to you, like use some of the effects in PowerPoint to show those sentences coming in rather than having a block of sound coming in. Um, if you don't want to use a PowerPoint specifically, there's a lot that can be done about how you work. Do you work analog? Do you work in a computer? How, how, does, how do you conceptualize sounds? Can you play with how you came up with some of that in a recorded form. Can you play with, okay, you have Malcolm's voice, which is great and resonant, but it's not the creator's voice. So how does your voice sound in, in your particular context? Like what, what is your inflection? What is the creation part of how you put it together? How did, how did you come up with it? Like, is it something that comes out of your brain full, full form or is it something that like gets moved around a lot? And how much of that process do you want to show? Because I think there's a lot, I, you know, my mind is flying because there's a lot of different ways that you can show all of the ways that 
your particular artistry came to be. And you can show us a lot about how you think and your mindset if that's something that you're open to. Or you can keep it on task if that's something you're not. But I think your personality and how you feel about this particular work and how you conceptualize your work is going to give you the best information about how to display it. And I'm happy to talk to you uh, uh, off camera too, if you have specific things you want to get into. I just want to make sure that um, I'm not, you know, <laughs> opening up all your can of worms in front of everybody because it's kind of hard to kind of think raw about your work when you're being watched. <laughs> there are other people watching me? No, no, none at all. <laughs> all right. Who else? Also, uh, Katie, if I may, this is Maria. Um, another thought I have at that, because I have both wordsmith, heralded, and presented awards, because I am in a very unique position. Just because a herald reads it a certain way does not mean that is how you intended it to be read. Yes. <laughs> um, and I'm willing to help you with that, too. We can, we can do it over separately if you could say hey that you know this is how it would be read this is how it was read in court this is how I intended it to be read mm -hmm. and we can play with that another time also if you want yes. I will definitely hit you up for that I and, have no doubt and then I invite I invite you if you're going to have this conversation part of that conversation might be part of your presentation of your project because there's going to be insights in that dance of conversing about your work with another person who is also familiar with this type of work that's going to bring forward certain things that are magical about the way you think. Cool. No, that's, that's actually really helpful because like wordsmithing as its place in ANS is not new so much as not explored as much as some other art forms. So it's I like I'm starting something newish. I mean, I'm not obviously because wordsmithing has been around for a while, but as its own art form, it's not explored as much. I guess. Yeah. So then the, the way that your, your particular lens, your voice in this particular art form is a big part of the project. So bringing that forward, I think, will make you feel better and, and make you feel stronger about what you offer, but also make you feel complete in the offering rather than saying, oh, I hope it scores well, which we all hope things score, score well. But ultimately, whatever you present should be the most complete offering of what you have on any particular day. All right. Any other questions, thoughts? Mm -hmm. Possibly. Possibly, okay. While we're on the very YouTube thing spectrum, yeah. I have never been to an ANS competition. Yes. So this is a bit overwhelming for me. <laughs> well, but you came. Yeah. Um, I suggested, I was thinking of doing demonstration, not competition, because I don't think, because I've never experienced any ANS, I figure I'd put, put in. So I don't know what even to do, what part, what to show, because I don't have a project, I have pieces. Because I'm actually doing something I started before I even joined SCA. Okay. So it's kind of like, what, are, what do I tell about it? What do I show? And one of the things I'm doing is I'm trying to track back in Slavic embroidery because there is no records during most of the period. But I have access to artisans in Russia that are doing folk embroidery and I've taken classes from Russia. And I'm thinking of tracking them back. So I have examples of Slavic embroidery that may have been used in the period. 
so that's excellent. How do I present this? Haha. Well, <laughs> my thoughts are going to be if you, if the presentation is display for this virtual format, um, are you able to show some of the segments that you have? Can you give us a through line of what your desires are eventually? Uh, what it is that you're trying to do? Um, are, are any of these wonderful Russian embroiderers willing to be recorded talking to you about embroidery, they're even not, if it's in Russia? They're in, Russia, <laughs> they're in different schedules. They cannot be recorded. And the, all of the classes are paid, so they will not show any of their own things. Okay, so these are classes. only my own. Okay, so these are classes rather than conversations, so that's, that's they're different. They're classes, and they're in Russian, so you wouldn't be able to. Yeah, no, I, and that was my confusion. I think um, if you were having a conversation in Russian with someone, even if you did like play audio of a Russian conversation that no one else could hear, as long as that person had authorized their side of the conversation and you provided a translation, man, is that beautiful color. Even if it's, you know, <laughs> um, you could take, you know, 30 seconds of you talking about it in Russian and <laughs> have that. Um, sort of part of the process. I'm always looking at how do we show things in a way that shows our heart, that shows why we're in it. One of the things that I am not comfortable with doing video editing at all. Okay. So. <laughs> so, so don't. So don't. So one of the things that I could have done today was actually run a video mixer and run all of the cameras that I have in the house so I didn't have to jump around and like show things. I decided not to do that. Um, not because it's hard for me to set up, but because I didn't want to show you like super polished because who cares? It's just not that important when it really comes down to it. So um, take a video, start and stop. Don't worry about blurring in the edges, you know, like say something like I'm spilling water right now. I'll be back. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Whatever it is that. Go with pictures. Yeah. Because the lighting in this house is just absolutely awful. There's no no way I can bring enough lights to it. Okay. So take so pictures. I, yeah. Pic yeah. Pictures work too. Good. Pictures work too. We have entire embroidery treatises that are just pictures frame to frame and illustrations, uh, little line drawings of stitches. And we've gotten by really well with those. Yeah. So pictures yeah, work. For years and years with only black and white pictures at that. It's true. And, you know, back when, when, when I was young, when rocks were soft, like, you know, we do, we didn't we even have pictures sometimes and you just have to like draw it out for someone that, you know, it's all fine. And one thing I would um, also recommend is um, maybe if you can send an email to that um, consultation, um, if you're new to A&S in the SCA specifically, um, we have a lot of really skilled embroiderers and we can perhaps find someone who you could bounce ideas off of because um, replicating a X and piece is different than what you're trying to do. Yeah, and there is no X and pieces. Yeah, so I think having having somebody who's an experienced embroiderer in the SCA to talk to will help and we could definitely try to make that connection. Yeah, and there are people in, in the Athena Thimble Guild that, not for this particular thing, but have, have chased down historical rabbit holes on things we don't have pieces for. So it's it's not um, unheard of <laughs> that I someone has gone on that church. doing this kind of research. I actually work as a researcher. So, cool. Um, and I have access to the Russian language libraries, which is helpful. Very. Translation. Very, very. So yeah, so we're, it'll be exciting to learn what you know. Okay. This is um, Yvonne. I was just going to suggest, I, I don't know if you're on the Slavic interest group. Um, I am. But, okay, great. So that that's helpful. Um, there are also um, some, uh, uh, what do I say this, okay. Laurel, who are, um, who are Laurels in Slavic embroidery, um, like myself, who uh, may be able to help out with some questions on these particular areas. Thank you. I've been getting most of my information from vk.com, which is Russian Facebook, actually. Yeah. So the old artisans are on there. Yeah, but I, I, Ivan is, uh, has created some jaw-droppingly gorgeous things that are definitely worth seeing. For sure. Thank you.
All right, you're welcome. Um, any other questions, thoughts? We are at time, so I want to respect people's uh, time that they have dedicated to be with us here today. If you have any questions or just want to talk through what a presentation might look like for, for your stuff, I am available. Um, I, it is my pleasure to kind of help you geek out on what it is that you're presenting for us, uh, especially for those of you who are entering Crown's uh, ANS Championship, which is coming very, very soon. Um, at least the, the sign up time is. Uh, I would love to help you display or compete in ways that make you happy and centered and excited about showing us what you did. Hey, Kiari, I have a question for you. See. So what was it like competing in Crown ANS as opposed to other competitions that you've been in? What has it been like being uh, ANS champion? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this on Sunday with Council with the Council. So I'm, I'm going to kind of say that anybody who needs to get off the call um, because of time, please do. And you can rejoin us on Sunday. But I'm going to make sure that um, I, I want to answer this.